presenting today on um, the Geodo Suite paper. Um, so it's really an entire analysis ecosystem for spatial data, um, all sorts of different omics. Um, uh, so um, I guess at the core, Geodo Suite is like a collection of R packages, essentially. Um, in terms of installing it, I think you only really it sort of bundled it into one, um, but it's sort of, um, there's a lot that goes into Geodo, I guess, in terms of the pieces. Um, they have a package for the, the data, um, for visualization, for the object itself, for the class, I guess. Um, they have this database backend that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then in B, one of the big focuses of, uh, this software was to make it sort of agnostic to the specific spatial technology being used. Um, so they try to emphasize that like uh, all sorts of different uh, technologies like Visium or like uh, different things from like NanoStrain and others, other um, technologies all sort of work with this um, set of R packages. Um, and in terms of like the biology, I guess, I think this figure really more shows like the spatial scale of things. They try to emphasize that like different um, aspects of like you can measure um, spatial information at the level of the tissue, at the cell, the nucleus, certain organelles even in theory can work with this structure. Um, so it sort of works across different um, spatial scales and then different biological um, different entities. Yeah, entities, I guess, would be a good word. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, they emphasize that like different types of data can be represented, which I'll describe more. I think a different part of this figure actually shows more of it, but briefly, um, of course, image data is evolved in spatial. So they have a class called Geodo large image, um, which handles like the most types of image data. Um, in terms of points, um, they say that like a transcript, measuring the gene, the expression of a transcript would be considered a point. Um, so they have a class for that. Um, you can measure intensity data as well. And then um, from the spatial end, you can measure different sort of shapes or like segmentations of cells or nuclei or other things. Um, and they have like a really generic um, polygon class to represent all sorts of types of shapes. Um, in terms of the information actually being measured, um, it's also sort of agnostic to like the type of assay, or we would call it an assay, like genetic information and epigenetic proteomics, which we don't really do too much, but well, I, I don't, I guess. <laughs> um, you have, you use them as PG's proteomics. Okay, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fair enough. Um, yeah, proteogenomics, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, um, really Geodo at its core is supposed to be very like um, generic, generic such that it encompasses different types of technologies, biology, and then just any sort of spatial information um, into one object. Um, so, um, I'm sort of going out of order here, but this is sort of how I, the order I read, or the order I did the paper in. Um, but uh, in terms of sort of the information, this describes more of like how they actually represent different types of information. Um, so they divide it into like features and then this spatial component. Um, so features are like the actual type of um, data that's being stored. So like, like I mentioned, like points, would be like, they say that the expression of a transcript would be a point because it's at a specific location and it has a specific value. Um, also like intensities, of like images, for example. Um, and then these could be measured at different, at different spatial units. So they have like this two dimensional in the bottom left corner here, they should have like, for each spatial unit, you could have like a different feature that's being measured. Um, so like the spatial units can be like, you can have segmentations, like I mentioned, they have like this polygon class to um, represent segmentation information. 
um, but also like spatial arrays. So like your ordinary Visian, I guess, um, that would be a type of spatial pattern, right? A, a spatial array grid type thing. Um, or it could be represented in terms of bins, which is more like Visium HD. Um, and then you can have more complex arrangements of any of these types of spatial patterns. Um, they say you could even nest them if you want. Um, and so you could have like point, points inside cells, intensities inside cells, and you could do all sorts of, it's very, um, I guess, open-ended what you can do with um, the, the object structure. Um, and then the, I guess the other component of this figure that I didn't really address is like, I think covered better in the next figure I'm about to show. So the, the actual type of the bottom left-ish, um, I guess zoom, people can't see my mouse, but um, I'll just go into the next figure. <laughs> um, so um, next we can get into like the actual Geodo object structure. And like, I think right away, most of us, when we see this, would be like, so you say, we would say something like, oh, this is a summarized experiment, <laughs> right? Like, it looks, it's very familiar. Um, and that's because it is sort of um, representing a lot of the same information, right? So we have um, the expression matrices, right? Just like assays in a summarized experiment, which are um, features by, they say cells in this case, but that it's really more generic than that. Um, and then, um, of course, you have metadata about both the features, so like your genes or your transcripts or your proteins or whatever, um, and then metadata about the cells, which would be like call data in a summarized experiment. Um, so a lot of these have like analogies with summarized experiment or I guess spatial experiments would be the better analogy, um, the more specific analogy. Um, there's a few differences, though. So um, there's actually like a multi-omics slot. Um, and um, I guess there's a lot of the same things, like dim the dimension reduction. Um, we have reduced stems in a single cell experiment, actually. Um, I guess something different is that they have a representation for like if you're doing types of like networks. Um, so you can, this would be like a, how each cell relates to each other cell. Um, so spatial enrichment, they mentioned like spot decomposition and things like that. But I think a lot of these things are, I would say could go into call data in a submarine experiment. Um, and then some of them are a bit unique. Um, in terms of like the, what they say is the physical space, there you have your spatial information. So like, um, spatial experiment would be spatial cords, um, which is a lot like the spatial lobes um, slot. But again, there's like room for like network type of analyses that um, I don't think spatial experiment would like explicitly support. Um, and then they also mention like the spatial grid um, aspect, which is like um, so, sort of like um, this reminds me of like the SE raster paper almost like sort of averaging expression in terms of grids. So you can have like lower dimension, dimensional representations of the spatial information. Um, so that's, I guess, a lot of analogies to summarize experiment, but then some of, some of its own stuff that's maybe a bit more flexible. Um, but yeah, very similar overall, I'd say. Um, so yeah, with, with this type of object, they showcase like a few different analyses that probably wouldn't be possible without this really flexible object structure. Um, the first one was showing that, um, so they have the same spatial, spatial region, but they have different types of segmentations. So they, in A, they segmented the cells, um, and in B, they segmented the nuclei. Um, so you have two different types of segmentations on the same spatial region. Um, so they did this Murfish data set to showcase this. Um, and then I guess like the interesting part of the analysis is this, this next section. So I took part of the figure. Um, they did a couple different analyses. Um, and um, so I guess this is sort of out of order, but this is grouping things together by one of the types of analyses they did. 
Um, I'll start with panel D on the top right corner. So something unique that they were able to do is based on the way that the spatial information is represented in the object was that they could actually do a differential expression analysis trying to see what genes were expressed in versus outside of a cell, which is sort of an interesting thing to be able to, hard thing to be able to do without a really organized object structure like you have with the Giotto object. Um, so for each gene, they show like the log twofold change um, and then they rank. So that's why it's descending, like the full change is descending as you go right. Um, and so a lot of cloud genes, of course, aren't going to be differentially expressed, but you do get some. Um, and then for the ones that were, um, that brings us sort of to panel F. So um, on the left half, we're, well, the, the whole figure in general is doing gene ontology. Um, and so on the left part, we have genes that are enriched in within the cell. Um, and so you can see like the terms that correspond to that. They, they group them all sort of um, into like, um, a lot of them are like nucleotide binding related, but um, you have something similar, of course, for the um, genes that are enriched outside of the cell. Um, and then unsurprisingly, you get all these like extracellular type um, type terms. Um, and then something cool, a sort of cool visualization they didn't see was they took genes that were, um, they specifically selected genes that were enriched in these two, two different terms, ribonucleotide binding and then connective tissue development. And then they plotted the expression. I'm actually, I should look more into the methods and like how they actually generated this image. But the general idea is um, they showed like the expression of these genes that were enriched in these terms. And then you can see that um, it's colored nicely by where like in versus outside of the cell. Um, but as a whole, like this type of analysis is just like, I think pretty novel um, and shows just how like flexible the object structure is that you could ask these sorts of questions, these sorts of sp unique spatial questions. Um, I think they did something similar for nuclei, but this is this was like this cell inside versus out cell version. Um, um, so another area where they wanted to showcase was that like it's very flexible. You can do like multi-omic analyses since it's able to these objects are able to represent different types of information really flexibly. Um, so in this figure, they show like um, you have like RNA expression and then protein expression um, sort of in the same object. Um, so a lot of that is like, you have two different like assays almost, well, how, how I would think of it. And um, you can do dimensionality reduction on each of them in independently. But then something interesting that it did was they tried to try to integrate the information together. Um, they did this weighted, weighted nearest neighbor graph, both the RNA and the protein. Um, assays to get sort of like this combined UMAP. Um, so you can, I guess you can leverage both, like leverage different types of information to get like um, sort of the most interesting um, results. Um, and so they, in the object, they have like, this, I think I mentioned that they have like a multi-omic slot for this specifically, um, which is cool. Um, and in terms of like the metadata, you have metadata for both the assays independently, but then also the, the multi-omics um, information. So um, yeah, it's, it's really built into the object that you can do these multi-omic analyses in a way that's, I don't think like spatial experiment is. Um, so this is cool to see as well. Um, okay, so I think this is sort of, this is pretty related to the last figure in that, um, they wanted to showcase how, like, again, the multi-omic analyses were possible and get better results than like doing analyses on one of the types of information alone. Um, so in panel B, they have they did clustering on just the RNA data. Um, so they they clustered and then they annotated. Um, actually, I don't think they should. But yeah, they do in this. Um, so they have the EMAP as well. Um, 
So they do that for the RNA slot by itself. They do it by sort of prote proteomic slot by itself. Um, and then you each get 12 clusters from, from those analyses. Um, but then they, sh they showed that you could leverage both like slots to do clustering. And then when you do that, you get 13 clusters. And their point was that it, um, it really captured the cell type structure more accurately than either of the, the slots alone. Um, and so in panel E, they compared it against like a single cell RNAC data set that they, uh, they ran deep convolution on. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, I guess you have to have some sort of reference for your baseline. Um, I guess we've shown that sometimes these, these spot decomposition results are um, very variable, depending on what method you use, but there is a better correspondence just visually uh, in terms of the cell types between D and E. And so they said, like, I guess the overall big picture is that like you get more powerful results when you um, by doing these multi omic results than you could do by leveraging just one of the types of information alone. Um, and so that's really just built into these objects that you can do this types of, types of things. Um, um, yeah, so another, um, so we've done a, a couple of different comparisons. We've done like the same um, data with different, uh, different spatial scales. Um, and we've done different um, assays at the same uh, sort of the same information. And now another thing we wanted to showcase was like measuring the same type of information, but with different technologies. Um, so here, this whole figure is comparing, comparing Xenium and Visium. Um, so in panel D, they have like, they took each of the genes and then they, um, they want to take a correlation between basically the expression of measured with Xenium versus measured with Visium. Um, and on the x-axis, it's like our, it's ordered by rank of that correlation. Um, and so a lot of, as you would expect, there's a pretty good correlation with a lot of the genes. You would hope that different technologies would generally be um, concordant in terms of expression. Otherwise, like, what are we measuring? Um, but um, yeah, so that, I guess that goes into panel. E, which is honestly from like a data visualization perspective alone, it's pretty a pretty pretty interesting plot. Um, it's measuring something similar to panel D. So um, each point is like a gene, um, and then to to locate the point on the y-axis, they average the expression between Xenium and Visium for that gene, um, and then they draw a trend line for for the expression for Visium, and then a trend line for the expression of Xenium alone. Um, and then the x-axis orders them by the rank of the correlation between physium and CD. That makes sense. So um, they drew these lines to show that, or the, the regression lines show that um, basically the, the higher the expression of the gene, um, the more good cordon the technologies are. Um, so it's really the low, lowly expressed genes that are driving disagreement between the technologies this would be another way to say it. Um, and F and F and G show that um, same type of overall message. Message, but they took some of the genes that you can see in panel D, um, FASN and HDC. So FASN was one of the highly correlated um, genes between Xenium and Visium, as you can see visually in F. Um, and then similarly, G was one of the ones that was lowest ranked by correlation. And um, again, visually, you can see that there's pretty poor correlation in that um, also just in terms of the actual values of expression, you see much higher expression in FASN. It's like not surprising um, given that overall finding. Um, so yeah, it's um, pretty easy to measure, like the, the object is flexible enough to measure both of these different types of technologies, which allowed them to do this type of analysis, which was cool to see. Um, and this was sort of mentioned in the discussion of the paper, but um, they said that in the discussion, they said like this really flexible object structure um, didn't really do too much of it, except in this figure, I, I'd say 
where the optics sort of allows them to benchmark different technologies, different, um, in this case, like segmentation techniques. Um, but since it's so flexible, you can measure, you can do a lot of benchmarking. Um, and so in this figure, they tried um, four different segmentation techniques or um, software, I guess. So they did here in panel A, original is from, is like the segmentations from 10X genomics, just that you get out of the box. Um, and then they have these alternative methods, which some of which we've used, like self-pose, um, Stardust, and then Phaser. Um, and so that each of them gives slightly different segmentation results as to where the cells are. Um, and so like they, in panel B, they zoom into a specific region and then they show that like, I mean, from a, like from a big picture, it's hard to see that, that they're actually pretty different. Like these, these different software can give pretty different segmentation results. Um, and uh, yeah, I should mention that these images are colored by the, uh, they, they annotated the cell type after doing segmentations. Um, so that's what the color is in these images. Um, and so next, um, next they did like a, a UMAP and then they, uh, they, they sort of put both of them, they did the UMAP with both of the, um, with each of the segmentation methods together. Um, and so they get like this shared space where they could annotate different cell types. Um, and then um, they did a, different, a few different types of comparison. So like panel D, um, they wanted to show that like actually just in terms of like the cell area that was segmented, there's pretty noticeable differences um, in terms of just like the size of these cells um, between methods. Um, and then panels E and F sort of represent the fact that once they use these shared annotations, they, they try to do um, like differences between the expression of these cell types. Um, so, um, in general, like in panel E, there's like a decent correspondence between like um, quantities of the, or like the, how much of each cell type is called by the, each method. Um, but there definitely are like, they said for like stromal cells in the very left and E, um, there's pretty noticeable differences. Uh, and so like, uh, yeah, panel F sort of represents the same information as bar plot, um, where you get decent agreement between cell types, but like I said, stromal and other cell types are a little, little bit more different. Um, and their takeaway was that like, by in this benchmark, they could show that like segmentation results are, can really change the um, ending analysis or uh, the ending conclusions about the information, like what cell types are present. Um, and, um, clustering other, uh, they didn't show it here, I guess, but like other types of analysis, downstream analyses can be pretty, um, like thoroughly affected by um, what segmentation method you choose. Um, and then some of these things that were, um, these were sort of miscellaneous notes that I took um, on other parts of the paper that weren't really figures. Um, so in terms of like performance um, and like memory usage, they mentioned that they developed this database backend that was designed to, um, because a lot of these technologies have just like, would re use really high memory usage if every, if all the data was represented in memory. So um, for like points and polygons, they have these database objects that um, enable you to like, or, they're on disk representations, so uh, they're more efficient in terms of memory usage. Um, similarly, I mean, this is, you can do these with the spatial experiment as well, but um, you can just store the expression matrices as HDF5 matrix objects, which is another on disk representation. Um, and then something really useful, I think, for us is like they have, they have conversion utilities with spatial experiment directly, so both ways, by the way, so you can do spatial experiment to Giotto and backward, um, but also and data and Surat. And I think even by extension, you could 
probably use these methods to convert between like spatial experiment and, and data and or spatial experiment and Surat. I I guess you, one thing we could check is like if information is lost between in translation, if certain types of information can't be represented, um, which is probably um, probably true. Um, and then so that's all I had for the paper, but I also wanted to show a bit of the documentation website because certain things are interesting and useful for um, for us. So um, the documentation I'd say is like pretty pretty thorough. Um, it's like a website just like similar to what we make for our packages that we develop. Um, something some specific things that are, I think are interesting are. Um, so they have examples for, um, if you just go into like the Visium examples, they have Visium, they have Site Assist, they even have HD examples already. Um, so like a lot of, it's cool to see that they have support for HD data already. Um, so like you can go in here and then they have um, functions to like create the object from Visium HD and things like that, which will be interesting for what I'm doing. Um, and I should, I should mention that, like, I think it's very similar to Surat in terms of, um, they have sort of like dedicated functions for like doing gene filtering, for doing normalization, for running PCA and all sorts of things like that. Um, and, um, another thing I wanted to draw attention to was, um, was in um, interoperability. So if you were to like the interoperability with spatial experiment, I think that would be probably relevant for us. So not only, like I mentioned that there's two different functions for converting back and forth. Um, so, I mean, of course there's that aspect, but I think what this vignette goes through is sort of interesting and in that it covers, um, it shows, so for the, spatial experiment side of things shows sort of like a bioconductor related, related analysis. Like it shows a lot of the things that we do. So um, I think it's, no, it's actually the first one. Um, it shows like adding QC metrics with skater, um, normalization with um, like a type of log normalization that we're familiar with bioconductor. And of course, I mean, all these things we're familiar with, but my point is that um, it shows sort of like the analogous type of analysis that you could do with the geodo object. So for each each piece of this analysis, the filtering, the normalization, the feature selection, um, you can see sort of like a, the geodo way to do it. Um, so I think this could be useful for us if we um, decide to use this. Um, so it's really the same types of things, but the geodo version, which I think is really useful. Um, and um, yeah, that went kind of fast, but that's all I have.